Amen. <clears throat> it's what we talked about yesterday, right? Outstanding. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. Feliz Sabido. Bienvenido a Nuestra Iglesia. Welcome to our church. So glad that everyone who's here today could make it. I know we have um, this function in Tampa today, and I appreciate you all being here um, today. We talk a little bit today in the beginning of this about something called Bernoulli's Principle. Have you ever heard of it? Bernoulli's Principle is a principle that encompasses some laws of, of uh, fluid dynamics. Daniel Bernoulli uh, was the scientist who actually published um, a book called Hydrodynamics in 1738, where he, he did experiments and worked through the math on, on how uh, fluid moves around certain objects and what the impact or effect of that is. In fact, it is Bernoulli's principle is the reason that we can have airplanes fly and submarines do so well uh, in, under the water. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that uh, today, the science of it, because it's really quite fascinating. And then try to, to bring this together to a more contemporaneous spiritual principle about how this can work in our lives as well. Uh, my opening verse is Matthew 11:28 28 to 30. It says, and then Jesus said, come to me all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Anybody here weary, carrying heavy burdens? And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Amen? Amen. Oh Lord, we're so grateful again for your presence here. Help us to have our hearts open to the Holy Spirit, that it would be your words that are spoken here today, I pray in your precious name. Amen. Well, let's start by this basic concept that we believe that God is the creator of all the natural laws, right? All of them. Yeah. The fact that a constant for time is 300 million meters per second, approximately, right? And that nothing can exceed the, the speed of light. Um, or that uh, time's arrow uh, shows that time only moves in one direction, which is forward. It doesn't move backward. Or uh, Archimedes' principle, which defines how an object might displace water and float, or in a fluid, or even Bernoulli's principle, what we're going to talk about today, how an airplane that weighs tons and tens of hundreds of thousands of pounds is able to lift off of the ground and to fly through the air. God created all of these natural laws, all of the mathematics and the physics and the biology that we study. These are all things that were created by God. Scientists many times think that they have uh, created something, some model or a formula, but it's a discovery of something that God has already put in place ahead of time. And all they've done, and God has at some point allowed us to be able to see those things, maybe to better understand him. You know, Albert Einstein, when he did his little E equals MC squared formula, he came to this conclusion that the universe would be um, would end either through fire, which would be a collapse of the universe, or ice, which would be this continued expansion of the universe. So basically, in his original uh, theory of relativity, he determined that there has to be one of two things: either, either this from the Big Bang theory, where everything was cast out from this massive explosion from this point of singularity that eventually it's all going to come back on itself, which will create an enormous amount of energy and heat and fire, or that the universe would just simply continue to expand. And as it did, as the planets moved further and further away in this vast expanse away from suns and stars, that we would all freeze to death. One of the two things would happen. There would be death by fire or death by ice or destruction of the universe. He didn't like either of those. 
So you know what he did, like what many scientists do? He just created a new theory, something that was more <laughs> in line with what he thought might be a better way for things to go. Uh, in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty. There's a, a Jewish term, I believe it goes, it's hovu vitovu, which means like helter-skelter or completely chaotic and disorganized. And from that, he formed the heavens and the earth. And darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God, we're, here we get into some of the discussions about the Godhead, was hovering over the surface of the waters. In Christian education, Ellen White writes this. She said, the greatest minds, if not guided by the word of God in their research, become bewildered in their attempts to trace the relations of science and revelation. Because the creator and his works are so far beyond their comprehension that they are unable to explain them by natural laws, they regard Bible history as unreliable. Right? That makes sense? I've, I watched this uh, YouTube video where this guy said, well, we can use science to prove the existence of God. And, and I watched it, and I, I think it was just not a joke, but it wasn't true. I, I have been a scientist all my life, and I will never believe that science and religion will ever find a place together. Because science says that for every natural event, there has to be a natural explanation. That's the basis of science. But in, in religion, in our worship of God, what happens is we see supernatural events that cannot be explained by natural occurrences because they are what? They're supernatural. I've seen so many times that people have tried to explain how did, how did all those 2.8 million people survive in the desert? If you look at Exodus and you look at the amount of water and food and everything else that they needed on a daily basis, there was no way that that could be explained. When the, the Red Sea split, I know I've seen the pictures, you have too. It shows it, what, about 30 feet wide and then a bunch of people single file marching through. Well, if they marched through single file, it would have taken them about three years to get through. The line would have been all the way back to where they started in a serpentine fashion, back to where they were and back again. In order for them to have crossed the Red Sea in 24 hours, I calculated it at 2.8 feet per second of their movement with about a three foot distance between them because of their animals, and you look at the width of their shoulders, they would have had to have been 10,000 abreast, and that Red Sea would have had to have parted in the neighborhood of three to five miles. But there are scientists who will try to explain it. Oh, it was because of an earthquake or a big wind. Now, I, I've seen some pretty big winds in my life. <laughs> but none that would part a sea by three to five miles. No way, not three miles. What happens is, and it says here, if their minds are not guided by the word of God in their research, they don't understand. And when we don't understand, like what Albert Einstein did, it was too big for his brain that the, that the universe was either going to collapse on itself or expand into oblivion. He had to come up with something else because we couldn't explain it. I'm going to talk a little bit about this idea of drafting. We're going to talk about Bernoulli's uh, principle today. And basically, Bernoulli's principle is just a model of mathematical formulas that uh, explains how an object moves through a particular fluid. It, it's, it's, the field is called hydrodynamics. And uh, when, like with an airplane, uh, you know how an airplane flies? You know how it can actually fly? It's, it's not that the wings are lifting. It, there's not that um, pressure that it's pulling up. What happens is because of the shape of the wing and the airfoil of the wing, as it moves through the air and it reaches certain critical speeds, the pressure on the bottom of the wing is greater than the pressure on the top of the wing, and it lifts itself up. Mm. It's really cool. It's actually quite scary. As a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons I just don't like to fly anymore. <laughs> it's because of that natural law. But, but we see that principle in other areas, and swimming is one of them. I, when I had all my own body parts, I used to do a lot of triathlons, 
and then the triathlon, it's a swim, a bike, and a run. And so in the swimming part of it, um, I had a bit of an advantage over some of these athletes because I have a higher percentage of body fat, so I tend to float. So most of my energy was, uh, was in a forward motion. A lot of these um, less body fat um, triathletes, right? I mean, some of these guys, if you had a body fat more than 3%, they want to give you a handicap sticker, you know? I mean, it was crazy. But what happens to them is that they sink. So about a third of their energy has to be committed just to remaining on the surface because that's where this concept comes in. So what they do is they draft. And what drafting does um, is that they would get directly behind and a little bit to the one side of another swimmer. And what would happen is that swimmer, as they pass through the water, would create an area of lesser pressure behind them. And the person behind them would get into that area of lower pressure and there was less resistance. It, 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 actually, in the studies that they've done, it resulted in a mean decrease of about 7% of heart rate during the last four minutes of these swimming competitions, right? And, and it doesn't only help the person uh, behind you, it helps the person in front of you as well. In all the drafting conditions, all of them that they studied, oxygen uptake, heart rate, blood lactate. Blood lactate is uh, part of the Krebs cycle process where the lactic acid is produced in the muscles due to exertion, which you don't want, and then oxygen converts that and it takes that lactic acid back out. Those, and stroke rates were significantly reduced while stroke length was higher than in non-drafting. That means that the number of times that they were swimming, their arms, that strokes, was reduced, but the length that they gained on each of those strokes was better because there was less pressure or resistance. What are the residual effects of it? Well, it says the main result of the present study indicated a significant effect of swimming metabolic load on oxygen kinetics and efficiency during subsequent cycling at a competitive pace. What that means is that not only did you do better in the water, now for this to happen, you gotta be behind someone who's faster than you, right? Or else you end up going slower which was never a problem for me. And so I would be behind somebody who was faster than me and I would swim in their wake, basically, is what it was. And then when I get out of the water, I'm actually more rested than I would be if I was by myself fighting the full resistance of that water against me. So remember, the main part of this is that as I'm swimming in the front, I have to be, face all of the resistance of the fluid, those fluid dynamics. But behind that person, that fluid goes over top and forms an area of lower pressure, lower resistance, and now I don't have to swim as hard to accomplish the same thing. Pretty cool. So when I get out to go into the cycling part of it, I'm more rested. It says, with this framework, a prior 750 meter swim performed alone resulted in faster oxygen kinetics and a significantly higher global energy expenditure during subsequent cycling in comparison with an identical swimming bow performed in a drafting position. Pretty neat. How many of you, you've seen this on the road where people will get right behind a big truck? Have you seen this? And you know what they're doing? They're drafting. And this is part of this Bernoulli principle. So what happens is that, that semi-tractor trailer is screaming up against the wind and the air comes, the big air pressure on the front comes over and it forms this, this area of low pressure behind the, the trailer, and when the car gets into that area of low pressure, yeah, they're actually traveling without the resistance. So they still have to keep their foot on the gas, but the gas mileage is significantly improved. So this works in human kinetics, it works in mechanical kinetics as well. In cycling, it's even more significant. Now, some of you, as you drive along, and you'll see these cyclists either on the road or on the trail, and they're, they're they're cycling what's called a peloton, right? There's usually six of them or more. Normally you wanna have six persons on this drafting thing to start. So what happens is you'll see them riding and they're a little bit offset from each other. You notice that? Not exactly behind each other. Part of that is safety, because if the person in front of you stops quickly, 
you want to be able to go by them and not into the rear end of it. But this drafting zone, right, and this is how we raced when I raced in the, on the bicycles. The drafting zone, it's a rectangular area, you can measure it, about 21 feet long, 23 feet by 6 feet 6 inches. And it surrounds each of those bicycles. And that's that area of, of your maximum resistance. So the lead rider, let's say we have a five person pace line, they use about, and here's the, the key part to this. The person behind the lead person uses significantly less energy, about 30% less energy to maintain that cycling speed. But it even benefits the person in front because there tends to be a bit of a pull resistance that they get to experience because of that effect of the Bernoulli principle and the rider behind them engaged inside of that area of lower resistance. It's just amazing. If you ever watch, if you're so bored in your life, you have nothing else to do. If golf is exciting for you, then you should watch um, the Tour de France or some of these cycling races sometimes and watch how they take advantage of these drafting. The lead person uses two to three percent less energy than they would if riding solo. The next in line needs only about 71 percent. So they're saving almost 30 percent of their energy. Um, the third and fourth riders are saving 35 percent, and the fifth rider is saving almost 40 percent of their energy. Yes? Is that the same concept that geese use? Yes, and we're going to talk about geese in just a minute because it's the exact same idea that they do. This is God giving us these natural laws in order to benefit the things. Yeah, it's, it's just so cool and it's so amazing. So what happens in the pace line is that you have the front person who's ex expending the most amount of energy. They're running as fast as they can. These are almost like a bunch of little mini sprints. That's how these guys maintain their speeds at 24, 25 miles an hour. And what happens is as the front person begins to tire, what do they do? They drop, they go to the left, they drop back into the back. The person behind them, who's been operating at 30% better efficiency now, takes the lead. That person goes into the back position where the most or the least amount of energy is exerted and recovers, and they continue to rotate through this pace line. So a lot of this is strategy. With these a lot of it, it absolute strategy. If, if you're out there in a race and you're going solo, you're not going to win. The pace lines are, is what gives these guys the ability to ride 100 plus miles a day uh, without throwing up and falling over and passing out. How about auto racing? Mm -mm -mm. I've seen it there. Right? As a single car races around a track, it creates a bubble. You can see it right there. And this is the Bernoulli principle. That bubble is an area of low pressure right, or low density air. The difference in pressure between these two air pockets creates drag, the force that impedes motion. The drag force limits the top speed the car can attain. So that's what happens here. For example, if I jump out of an airplane, when I used to skydive, there was something called a free fall position, where, and this is the free fall position, where your arms and your legs are spread and you're coming flat down. The maximum, what they call terminal velocity, for a human being is about 120 miles an hour. Now, why is that? Why is it that if gravity is accelerating at eight meters, eight meters per, per foot per foot, right? Or, I'm sorry, eight miles per hour per square meter, per cubic, square meter, I'm sorry, per square meter. I got the formula wrong. My apologies. Why is it that we don't continue to accelerate to infinity? Air resistance, that's right. And there comes a point of equilibrium between the body falling due to gravity and the resistance of the air against that body. Now, if I go into what's called a delta position, if I take my hands and I put them at my side and I spread my legs and I go head down, I can achieve speeds of about 220 miles per hour. Why? Because there's less air resistance. The drag limits the top speed the car can attain. But if a second car pulls up behind the first, the slipstream created by the two merge so that the first car loses its aft bubble and the second car loses its front bubble and the effect reduces the drag force for each of those cars and they both experience a benefit from it. From a spiritual perspective, think about this. I have heard this saying, a Christian alone is in bad company. 
When we, the Bible says that we should do things in twos and threes. It says that, that you want to have two people because if one falls, there's no one around to help them get up. But with two people, there's someone there to help them to get up. Help, I've fallen, and I can't get up. And having other people there in our lives to support us means that we have to spend less energy in order to get ourselves through these bad situations. We, we rely fully on God and on the Holy Spirit, and he sends other people in our lives to be there for us. Let's talk about geese, since you brought that up. Same thing with geese. Uh, the advantage that's called the energetic advantage hypothesis, it talks about optimization at the base of the triangle. Now notice that geese fly in a triangular pattern. And if you were to take uh, geometrically and map it, you would see that they're flying on the hypotenuse of a right angle most of the time because in nature that is the most efficient model for them to fly with regard to drafting. Again, you can see that in swimmers. They're always off a little bit offset. And cyclists, not just for safety, but for the benefit of the drafting, they're a little bit off to the side as well. It also improves their visual communication because not only can they see the goose in front of them, they can see the geese to either side of them as well. They also fly in a V formation. Have you noticed that? You'd think if it was just a drafting issue that they would fly in a single line with each goose offset from the one in front of them, and that's all you would have is this big sort of linear goose thing going on in the sky. Honk, 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 and you'd look up, and there'd be a big line, but there isn't, is there? You see a V. Why do we see the V? Well, in order for the flock to fly, there has to be a lesser and a greater wing in the formation. The left side is of the lesser strength and is shorter. So next time you watch geese, go up and look at the V formation. What you'll notice is that the right side of the formation is longer than the left side of the formation. And the left side happens to have the weaker geese, or the ones that, that may be older or not as strong or maybe younger and don't have the experience to fly. The lesser wing is manned by the older and firm birds and by those that are too young to work the greater wing. The stronger birds are able to sustain the phenomenal stress of flying in the greater wing, and they are providing a release of energy or, or a reduction of the energy required, kinetic energy, to those on the left side. These are perfect Christians. That's what they are. Perfect Christians. Because each one is lessening the burden of the one behind them, and they're, the strong ones are lessening the burden of the weak ones. They bring the flock safely to their new home. Where do we want to go? Where is it that we as Christians want to go? Heaven. Safely to our new home. Yeah. This is not the place. No. And we are not going to get there alone. It's just not going to happen. You know. Again, a Christian alone in a bad neighborhood. Let's look at this from the concept of this spiritual vortex. Okay? It says in, in Luke 22, 3, and 3 to 6, Then Satan entered Judah, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. These are the disciples. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him. Who's him? Jesus. To them. Who's them? To them. To the high priests who they wanted him out of the way and the captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and they agreed to give him money so that he promised and sought opportunity to portray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So he was gonna do this originally as some kind of a, of a secret way to do it. But there is no secrets from God, is there? Because it's all for one and all for God. That's how it needs to be. God is good and all the time. Deuteronomy 6. Four through five is what's called the Shema. It's the most often spoken prayer in Judaism. It goes Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And, and then it continues on. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. We are given these natural laws because they are of a benefit to us. For example, without gravity, what would happen to us? We would just fly off the earth because it's spinning around at thousands of miles an hour. How come our hair isn't more messed up? That's what I wonder, right? 
But gravity balances centrifugal force and it keeps us so that we survive here on the Earth at, at this weight that we have and this place that we are. I know I've talked about it you know, many times in the past, but when Hezekiah was dying and he asked the prophet, please you know, go to God and tell him to save me, and the, the prophet comes back and says, God has agreed. He's going to give you 10 more years. You know? And Hezekiah says, this always amazed me. I mean, somebody, the prophet, if it was a prophet, I knew it was a prophet, and they came to me and said, God's going to give you 10 more years. I'd be like, yeah, that's good enough for me. Enough said. But not Hezekiah. He's like, well, can you prove it? Can you give me a sign? You know, I know you're saying this, but, but I need to really know that this is true. And what did, what did the, the prophet goes and speaks to the Lord, and the Lord says, tell him I can move the sundial forward 10 degrees or backwards 10 degrees. And Hezekiah, he says, well, it's probably not that big a deal to move time forward. And that just blew my mind. I mean, I know time moves in the forward direction. The time's arrow says time only moves one way. But I, as a human being, would never presume that advancing time artificially could be something that anybody could do. But Hezekiah seemed to think that that wouldn't be so big a deal. So he said, well, I want to move time backwards 10 degrees. 10 degrees on the sundial is about 40 minutes. God is not subject to the natural laws. And he moved time back by 40 minutes. Wow, just amazing stuff. We need to have this sort of Christian, this aerodynamic unity um, within our ranks. If we are going to make it to the final days, if we're going to end up going home, we're going to have to do this together. Miss White says, press together, press together, press together. You know how you keep from falling off the bed? You get in the middle. That's all. Just don't live on the edges of it. Be in the middle of this, and you'll be much safer. Ms. White writes this. She says, the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. If there is a large number in the church, let the members be formed into small companies. That's what we did. You know, this church came out of the large Clearwater Church and the large Newport Ritchie Church, and we wanted something in the middle, and we started by meeting at Jim Willis's home. There was just a few of us. And now, there's still a bit of a few of us, but look where we are, right? It's a whole different animal for us now. And if we get too big, then I think we ought to split again. It says, if in one place there are only two or three who know the truth, let them form themselves into a band of workers. Let them keep their bond of union unbroken, pressing together in love and unity, encouraging one another to advance, each gaining courage and strength from the assistance of the others. Does this describe how we should be as a church? You know, we're not just a building. We're not just a church, like from a religious, an organized religious perspective. I mean, what are we? We're Seventh-day Adventists. But what are we? We're, we're, we're monotheistic Sabbatarians. We believe in the Godhead and we keep the Sabbath and we believe in the three angels' message, right? It defines who we are, but we need each other. We need to have the unity of that belief if we expect to be able to make it home. We're just not going to do it alone. Unity in faith and faith in unity. Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 says this. Some of us have been given special ability as apostles. To others has given the gift of being able to preach well. Some have special ability in winning people to Christ, helping them to trust him as their savior. Still others have a gift for caring for God's people as a shepherd does his sheep, leading and teaching them in the ways of God. Why is it that he gives us these special abilities to do certain things best? Is it that God's people will be equipped to do better work for him? It is, I'm sorry, that God's people will be better equipped to do better work for him, building up the church, the body of Christ, to a position of strength and maturity, until finally we all believe alike in our salvation about our Savior, God's Son, 
and all become full grown in the Lord. Yes, to the point of being filled with Christ. Then we will no longer be like children, forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. How powerful is that? When we come together in unity, you know, these gifts describe the parts of the body of Christ. And it all comes together to form one whole. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruits of the Spirit. It is singular, the fruit of the Spirit. And it's all of those parts that are described that aggregate to become the fruit of the Spirit, which is what we are expected to have. And instead of us constantly waffling back and forth because some new person comes up with some new unique concept about God that nobody's ever thought of in thousands of years before, and we get swayed to that person's opinion because they're charismatic and they offer something emotionally that we need, our intellect takes over, our intellectual understanding because of the time we spend studying the Bible, the Word of God and we cannot be swayed anymore. And if we get weak or we get suspicious, we just call our Christian brothers and sisters and they help us to maintain our strength and our faith. Instead, we will lovingly follow the truth at all times, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly, and so become more and more in every way like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Under his direction, the whole body is fitted together perfectly, and each part in its own special way helps the other parts so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This is not uniformity where we all look and, and sound the same. It's not unanimity where we all march in lockstep. It's unity where all of us who have different gifts and are different parts of the body have different things to contribute all come together as one. That's what unity is. In Amazing Grace, we read, it says, Resolve not in your own strength, but in the strength and grace given of God that you will consecrate to him now. Just now, every power, every ability. You will then follow Jesus because he bids you, and you will not ask where or what reward will be given. When I'm in a Peloton drafting, the reason I'm drafting is because if I was left to do it on my own, if I were to back off from the group by, say, 30 meters, could drop back 100 feet, I'd never be able to catch them. I'd never make it to where they're going when they get there. You know, it's funny. You're on the plane, and, and the plane lands, and everybody jumps up, and they want to get off first and all that. You know, we all get there at the same time. Right? They're rushing to board that plane. Got to be on that plane first. I know because I'm an anxious, anxious, horrible, stressful flyer, and I need to be in that seat right away. But we're all going to get there. The plane, when the plane lands, everybody lands together, all 173 of us, in that Boeing 737-800. We're all on the ground at the same time. Let each one who claims to follow Christ esteem himself less and others more. Can we do that? Press together, press together. In union, there is a strength and victory. In discord and division, there is weakness and defeat. These words have been spoken to me from heaven. As God's ambassador, I speak them to you. We are blessed by the natural laws of Bernoulli's principle. It allows us to fly it allows us to exert less energy when we're in a pace line or when we're swimming. It allows geese to get to their destination all together and all well. And it allows us to be able to make it to heaven together as a body. Psalm 133, 1 to 3 says how, you know, it's interesting. This is Psalm 133, by the way. Do you know that? This is it. That's all there is. There's these three verses, Psalm 133. There's not 133, 1, 1 to 7, 133, 2. It's 133. It says, how wonderful it is, how pleasant when brothers live in harmony. 
For harmony is as precious as the fragrant anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head and ran down onto his beard and onto the border of his robe. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew on Mount Hermon, on the mountains of Israel, and God has pronounced this eternal blessing on Jerusalem, even life forevermore. In closing, we need to take advantage of the power of Jesus Christ. If we think that we're going to make it there on our own, we are sadly mistaken. We need to draft, if you will, behind uh, Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit clears the way ahead of us. He clears the path for us so that we can go forward in the work that we have to do. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, Since we have such a huge crowd of men of faith watching us from the grandstands, let us strip off anything that slows us down or holds us back, and especially those sins that wrap themselves so tightly around our feet and trip us up. And let us run with patience the particular race that God set before us. Keep your eyes on Jesus, our leader and instructor. <clears throat> he was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterward. And now he sits in the place of honor by the throne of God. You know, swimmers in these triathlons, they have what are called um, hydrophobic uh, wetsuits. When the temperature gets below 70 degrees, or 72, you put a wetsuit on. Those hydrophobic wetsuit, what that means is a fear of water. And those, those suits repel that water. So it significantly lowers their resistance. They love it when they get to wear the suits because we swim significantly faster. Some swimmers completely shave their bodies of all hair because the hair, they say, adds a resistance to what they do. Same with cyclists, you'll see them that they do that. It's a bit crazy as far as I'm concerned, but, but they're trying to take advantage of every possible thing they can, and we should be doing the same with the advantage that we get from Jesus. Hebrews 12, 12 and 13 says, so take a new grip with your tired hands, stand firm on your shaky legs, and mark out a straight, smooth path for your feet, so that those who follow you, though weak and lame, the left side of the V, right, will not fall and hurt themselves, but become strong. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Doris, that's your cue. So I have a challenge for you this week. It's more of a personal one. And that is, when you are in situations where you're trying to sort of muddle through, whether it's a problem with a relationship or a financial issue or a personal character issue or whatever it is, try, this is so hard to do, try to take a bit of an inventory and see whether you're doing it alone. Am I trying to get out of this by myself? Um, and if you are, call someone for help. Pray about it. But, but, but call another Christian, a friend or somebody else, and tell them what's going on with you and ask them for their help. Because so often we get into situations and we don't even recognize how deep we're getting until it's too late. You know, we don't need to get there. We can sort of nip it in the bud, if you will, and get someone to help pull us out. Amen? Amen. Let's close in our usual manner. Yirecha Adonai v'yishmarecha ya'ar Adonai panavalecha v'ikunecha yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yashamlecha shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Dismissed.